First, good afternoon, everybody. It's good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Great to be in person again, right? Um, it, this isn't the crowd that we expected, but this crowd we got, right? So, um, first off, I would like to welcome um, everybody to ASUWT's You Belong Here panel discussion. This discussion is the start of the work that we want to do to create a welcoming environment for all people who come to campus. That doesn't just include the students, that's faculty and staff as well. So this is that beginning work. Um, before I get into introducing our distinguished guest, uh, I would like to lay down some ground rules for both the audience and the panelists. Um, all opinions are valid, uh, rule number one. Rule number two, panelists and the audience will show respect to all speakers by allowing them to fully answer the questions given to them by the moderator, me. Uh, the moderator will call on Pacific panelists to answer questions. Each panelist has one opportunity to request to answer a question that they feel passionate about. Uh, question, uh, rule number four, each panelist will have no more than one minute and 30 seconds to answer the given question. And the moderator is free to cut off answers short when necessary. <laughs> I know I have a- Executive privilege. I know, yeah. <laughs> There's the power in here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now, with that being said and the ground rules being set, um, let me start by introducing our distinguished guest. Um, we have Lieutenant General Xavier Brunson, Commander General, General of One Corp. Uh, uh, Louis Brunson, Director of Crop, sorry, Director of Corporate Communications at Microsoft. Uh, Kara Daniels, City of Tacoma Councilwoman. Walter Braithwaite, former President of Boeing Africa and creator of the CAD and CAM system. Uh, Mintha, Mintha Wilson, uh, our Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, our very own. Uh, Loki uh, Mulhan, Mulhan um, Emmy Award winning filmmaker, author, and activist, and son of civil rights icon Joan Trump Power Mulhan. Um, and last but not least, uh, we have Yari Ortiz, UWT's first generation student, student initiative coordinator. Uh, these are our guests. And before we get started with our questions, I would like to give each one of you an opportunity to uh, give us your pronouns and how you would like to be addressed throughout this uh, panel, um, starting right here with our very own Mentha. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so pronouns are she and her, and I'm very informal, Mentha. Buenas tardes, Janira Pacheco. My pronouns are she, hers, ella. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yo entiendo más lo que yo hablo. Empezamos a hablar. Gracias, señora. Muy bien. <laughs> uh, Xavier Brunson, and uh, that's just fine. I don't have any pronouns, but just, just Lewis Brunson or just Lewis is fine. Thank you. On Zoom. Loki Mulholland, uh, he, him, uh, he's go by Loki. That's your Braithwaite? I mean. Walt Braithwaite, I go by Walt. And uh, I use she, her pronouns, and you can just call me Kiara, that's fine. All right, thank you guys. The first question I would like to present to all the panelists, and um, we'll start with ladies first with uh, Ms. Kiara. Uh, what does belonging in the space mean to you? Ooh, put me on the hot spot, me first, right? Okay, that's fine. Um, I think, you know, belonging means a lot of different things. I think uh, just like in the general sense, um, belonging means that it is okay for me to be there. It's okay for me to speak. Um, I typically feel safe in the space and um, kind of as I just shared, like uh, safe to share ideas. Um, and if I feel really, really, really uh, belonging in a space, like space to be my whole self. And that means kind of all the different uh, parts of my identity that um, my socioeconomic status, all of those things, right? Um, safe to kind of share those things and, and be my whole self, so. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Braithwaite, Walt. Uh, the, ter the, the term belonging is something that's natural to all human species, I think. 
We always, we all want to be belong to something. So my response will come in two phases. First, it depends on the kind of space. If it's a private space, such as a club, for example, if I'm a member, I expect to be included and treated equally as everyone else in that space. If it's a public space, then I expect to be welcomed. I expect to have all the uh, facilities, the examples, the what's available in the space available to me. I expect to be included and accepted for who I am and be encouraged to participate. Now, it's true that there are some people in public spaces that run organizations that don't like people, some people to be shared, to share that space with them. Under those conditions, I use my inner sense to tell me, do I need to be in this space? In a restaurant, for example, some, I, I'm there because I'm gonna spend my money, hard earned money. And if I'm not treated well, the question is begged, why do I stay here? So you have choices in some spaces, actually in all spaces. Thank you for that. Uh, Loki? Well, first, you know, thank you for letting me uh, participate in this. And also wanted to say a happy Founders Day to all my fraternity brothers and the greatest fraternal organization in the world, the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Um, it, you know, and to me, you know, I, I, I think about uh, my, uh, my DP who said to me, you know, be you. Don't just just be you and that belonging is that you can be in a space where you don't have to change yourself to accommodate other people's um, biases or fears or anything else that you can leg legitimately just be who you want to be. Um, that's what it means to me. Lewis. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for me, it's really um, sort of being your authentic self, uh, being recognized, um, being seen, and people can see you in your, your personal space. Um, feeling accepted. Uh, as, as Walt talked about, if you go to a restaurant or if you're in a business setting or if you're in an elevator, you, you wanna be recognized as who you are. You don't wanna be looked at as uh, you're not there, you're invisible. You wanna be seen, you wanna be recognized as just an individual trying to do what you do daily. That's what it means for me. Mr. Matson. Um, for, for me, I, I will tell you whether it was Kiera or Loki or Walt, or, or even Lewis, um, it is all those things and more. Um, but by virtue of my profession and the person I believe myself to be, uh, everywhere I walk, I'm supposed to be there. By virtue of my vertical alignment, right, of God, my family, and then this business that I do. But I'm also a leader. It's my job for everything that every one of the previous panelists said about what belonging is, is to set the conditions. So until I'm done professionally or on this earth, my job is to set the conditions where people can thrive. So that's what belonging means to me, is that the onus is on me to create the environment wherein people can be their actual best and authentic self. Belonging. Ms. Ortiz? B-O-L. <laughs> See, I'd be out of the spelling bee already. <laughs> Ms. Ortiz? Thank you. Um, for me, belonging is a space. Uh, I'm looking for a space where my voice is heard, mm -hmm. but also that I can see that my suggestions, my contributions, and, and, and the feedback count, a place where I feel that I'm respected and that I can provide respect also. Um, where I see myself, you know, like many of us have mentioned, a place where I can see people from my same background or similar background that we can connect and also a place that encourages, that promotes, encourages um, growth and learning at the same time. And like you said, sir, I think it's extremely important that in our positions and our spaces that we actually promote that and encourage that. Science. Last but not least. <laughs> so when I think about belonging, I think about it within the academic context. So many of us are affiliated with UW Tacoma and each and every day we are striving to create a space where everyone is seen, where they are heard, and where they are validated. And so for us, it's about community, a sense of connectedness. And someone said it earlier, it's about your whole self, no matter your identity. In fact, we want you to very much um, be expressive of your identity, share your thoughts and your concerns without reservations. 
So belonging means no matter who you are in what space, when you walk in, it's yours. You belong. We talked about a, a lot about making that space or feeling like you're seen in your space. And I'd like to direct this next question to uh, Mr. Braithwaite first. But how, does di how diverse was your college experience overall and within your program of study? I began my college experience in England. And there, we were quite diverse. I came to the US and attended school in Chicago. And again, my undergraduate years was quite diverse, an international group basically at the school I attended. In graduate school, however, when I came to the University of Washington, I was the only black person in the Department of Computer Science, the only student. And there were no black professors either then. I don't know if they have any now. I also attended MIT as a Sloan Fellow and there we had 56 people in my class and it was very international representing all parts of the world. So there I felt quite at home. Actually, I feel at home just about anywhere I go because I find myself in many uh, places where I am the only one or one of very few. I grew up on the island of Jamaica and there we have a very heterogeneous collection of people. And so you learn to get along and to work with everybody in the community. So diversity there, what I learned there, helped me throughout my life, which has been all over the world since. Thanks, Walt. Ms. Ortiz, would you like to take it? Sure. Um, my undergraduate was at the University of Puerto Rico in campus of Rio Piedras. That's the, the mothership, we call it mothership, right? Um, and uh, our campus, uh, in terms of low socioeconomic status, it was fairly diverse. However, graduate school, it was, I started graduate school at a predominantly white institution in the state of Iowa. Um, it provided me with plenty of opportunities, but in terms of students of color, we were, we were not many, especially my program of study. Um, I was extremely fortunate that I was part of the Graduate Minority Assistantship Program, and that program provided us with opportunities to do research with faculty, but also gathered us as a cohort of students from many places all over the United States, including Puerto Rico. And that became my support system. That became the group that helped me carry on. To this point, some of them are adopted family, to be very honest. And I was able to connect there with my mentor, who was Dr. George Jackson. Um, this world is very small. And um, this group has been the one who has been able to support me throughout my career. That's how I started Student Affairs. Thank you. Uh, Loki, would you like to take a crack at this question? Well, it's an interesting question, because I was thinking through this. Um, and actually, growing up, um, my elementary school, uh, there, there was no majority. Uh, and so my experience in college was the first time I had been in a space where everyone was white. So that was a really actually culture shift for me, wherein before we had you know, Southeast Asians and African-Americans and so forth. So all of a sudden I was just thrown in this sort of space where it was just like, Wow, and I felt out of place because I'd never been in a place like that growing up in the area that I did and, um, and with uh, my mom's friends and influences uh, that would come and visit and so forth. It was just, it was a real culture shock. Um, so it was kind of weird. And then I finished that school and went to Brigham Young University and it got even wider. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's different. It was, so I, I don't know how to even process that right now, thinking about that at that point. Thank you. The next question is, what were some of the challenges you encountered while in college and how did you work to overcome them? Uh, Ms. Haynes, you wanna start? Sure. I have a very fond, a fond I have a, a, a fresh memory about what it was like to be an undergraduate. In many ways, that's what propelled me for, uh, to pursue a career in higher ed. So I started out at a two-year college, a community college. Um, I had been admitted to a four-year, but I didn't think I had the confidence and the skill set to be productive in that environment. So already, that negative talk right in my head, I can't do it. So I started at a community college, got my confidence, got my footing, transferred to a four-year institution, and guess what? All of that emotion started flooding back. I don't belong, it's too big, everybody looks like they know what they're doing, what am I supposed to do here? 
And the moment of reckoning for me was being in the library by myself, studying by myself, and I burst into tears. Like, this is not gonna work for me. This is untenable. So let me figure out how I can get the heck up out of here, save some money, get a job, do whatever it is that I need to do, because college is not the space for me. But luckily, I had the wherewithal to find my way to what we refer to as the EOP program, which is a lot like um, First Gen. It's a place for individuals that um, are looking for community. And that's when I realized the greatest thing that anybody can ever do on a college campus is get connected. That is really what college is all about. Finding a space, finding a home, finding those individuals who are gonna support you, who are gonna challenge you. And that for me was a defining moment. So she told me, girl, you got the thing to Thank do you, it. Hines. Just don't do it by yourself. Uh, Mr. Brunson? Answer. Those cards are legit. That's really, right. that's really going down. <laughs> um, question again, please? Oh, this was uh, Mr. Uh, Lewis Brunson. Oh, Brunson, not, not Brunson. Brunson, not Brunson. Okay. Excuse me, Lewis. <laughs> Start the clock over again. Yeah, re reset for me, please. Um, the question was around challenges in college, right? Yes. Yeah, for me, um, I grew up in South Central LA, you know, in a pretty, pretty rough neighborhood. Um, and the principal was black in high school. Uh, the church, you know, everything was, was all black. Uh, and then I went to Washington State University to pursue a career in communications. And um, when I got to, to school there, uh, my biggest, some of my biggest challenges were dealing with other people, not knowing different cultures, uh, smelling different foods, you know, why are they eating that? Uh, you know, couldn't find hair products, so my hair is falling out now. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you just couldn't get what you got when you were at home, adapting and uh, adjusting to your environment. Um, being so far away from your family and friends and really learning about other people um, and learning about yourself and, and how to, to, to fend for yourself and, and mature and grow. So that was my biggest, I think, challenge is trying to figure out who I was and finding myself in college. Thank you. Our next question is, when things got difficult, whether academically or otherwise, what kept you grounded and motivated? Ms. Daniels, would you like to go first with this question? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, I was actually just thinking about the last question and um, I was thinking about, you know, what was difficult in college and uh, what kept me motivated and, and you know, the things that were, they're connected and the things that were difficult for me weren't really the things in college. It was like, I stayed home for, for school. So um, the things that were difficult for me were going on at home and, you know, not having anybody to relate to and um, having, you know, bills that have to be paid and, and still having to go to work, you know, a few different jobs to just make ends meet. And, and those are the things that were difficult. Um, and so every quarter I was the student who was like, I don't want to do this anymore. This doesn't make sense to me. Um, but when things didn't make sense in my life, uh, I found that when I would come back to school and I would be studying something where we would have our um, seminars where we would be getting lost in a book or talking about something bigger than what was going on in our lives, I felt like that was the only place that uh, made sense at the moment. And that was the couple hours of the day that um, I didn't have to worry about anything else. And so when everything else failed in life, I could always come back to school every single time. And, and really that lasted me through, you know, the four years for undergrad and then um, the, the two years that it took me to do um, grad school. But you can count on me being the student that week eight, I didn't want to do anymore. I was done every single quarter. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you get, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Mr. Brunson? Um, for, for me, uh, I think um, what I found difficult uh, was a little bit different. I grew up in a military family, and so I grew up in an environment where everybody was there. And you moved me to college, and now I'm at Hampton University, an HBCU, and that's a new experience for me because some of the folks that I encountered there didn't have like or shared experiences. But I gravitated toward a group of people that were in ROTC with me and guys that I played football with in college. And, and that, that provided me some safety. It provided me places to go. And, and I would tell you, you hard times are always going to be here. But as uh, 
as Mintha said, you've got to get connected somewhere. And you have to have a place where, or a person even, who you can be transparent with, who you can share with, uh, who, who you can just talk to sometimes. My parents were in Germany when I was in college. And at the time, if I wanted to talk to them, I'd have to use like a roll of quarters just to call my parents. So there were a lot of times those little nodes that I had around campus protected me and kept me safe and kept me going when things got hard. Ms. Ortiz? So I'm listening to all of your stories. I'm like, wow, yes. And, <laughs> and I can connect and it's very interesting. But for me, it has been my family, my immediate family, extended family. And that means even the neighborhood, you know. My house there, I was, I'm a first generation student. You know, I was the first one to go to college. And um, my grandma, she worked in the school system. She was uh, a custodial. And she knew from the beginning that for me, there was no option. You have to go to college. You're going to do it. And the same thing for my mom. It was interesting because while I was in college, my mom was trying to get her associate's degree while raising kids. I don't know how she did that. I don't know, honestly. And I admire her and I honor her. But support systems for me have been my padrinos, my madrinas, you know, you know your aunties, your uncles, and those adopted or by blood, you know. And um, they, surrounded my, they surrounded me even when I was away. And they make sure that I kept grounded, that I didn't think that I was too much. <laughs> you're not all that. You're good. You're good. But you're here and you're representing us. So don't embarrass us. That was always the thing. Don't embarrass us. So I would say my family, the immediate by blood and the one that is extended, they were my neighbors and, and those who supported, had supported me throughout the way. Thank you. Question number five. Did you experience discrimination while in college or early in, on in your career? If so, in which ways? And what was your response? I would like to start this question off with uh, Mr. Loki. No, I, I, I didn't face any particular discrimination. Um, but I, I, I do want to kind of jump back on, on my previous answer, because as I listened, I, I, it made me think about when I went to Ithaca College, and that's when I said it was the first time that uh, everyone looked like me. And even though uh, that was my first time in an education environment like that, I still fit in. You know, and so I didn't have to face anything uh, like that. Um, and so I, I, it's for me to, to have face any sort of sense of discrimination, not at all, only, only in, in thought uh, when I speak out, do I get people who suddenly want to say something about what I have to say. Yeah, I asked that question to you particularly because of the work that you do in um, bringing awareness to the struggles that black people have gone through in this country. Right. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been, I remember when I first got my first hate mail and called my mom and she's like, congratulations, welcome to the club. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was said, you know, it said that, you know, that I had absolute hate for the white race. And I'm like, that's weird because I like my mom, you know, I don't hate myself, so. Um, but that's, you know, you, you're going to get that. Um, but you have to be willing to, you know, you're just going to face what other men have met, right? You just need to see it through. Uh, Mr. Braithwaite. Same question? Yes, sir. Discrimination. Well, in college, no. Uh, in uh, undergraduate, I did not experience any discrimination that I could identify. But in my career years, yes, I saw some disrespect. I saw some exclusion from activities. I was not invited to be part of things. And I consider it, I thought about it as being discriminating, discrimination of some kind. They just didn't want me there. But how did I address it? How did I handle it? I just continued to do the job I was hired to do. I actually extended myself by trying to learn more about the job and beyond the job. I developed more skills. I practiced something called continuous learning, and I had more knowledge and skills about things surrounding the job than many of the people who were there before me or longer, many years before me. As a result, I had many opportunities to move on into other jobs. And those people who thought negatively of me, they were left behind. Mr. Brinson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for me, um, probably more in my career than in college. And uh, early in my career, uh, I was offended I didn't know really how to handle it. 
Um, I call friends and we talk about it and things like that. But as I got more seasoned in my career, um, I began to take it on head on, just, just go straight at it. So if I ran into a situation where I was in a conference room or uh, someone would say something to me that I thought was a little bit offensive, I would approach them and say, what, do, what did you mean by that? Can you explain that? Um, not in a negative way, but more of a, of a way to get to learn who they are and get them to know who I was. And now um, I just take it head on. I, I, don't, uh, I don't run from it because sometimes people don't know that they're being offensive. Sometimes they don't know what they're saying and maybe an opportunity for uh, a growth opportunity for someone and even for myself. So. Thank you. Our next question is, <clears throat> What were some of your greatest failures, and how did you use these failures to fuel your success? I'd like to start this question off with Mr. Xavier Brunson. Um, first of all, I just um, would, would just commend what Lewis just said. And so I'll cede some of my time just to get you all to remember that. Uh, it, you know, Baldwin has a quote, and I'm not going to give you the quote because I want you to look it up, where he talks about things that are faced and the only way to deal with problems, okay? So go look that up, James Baldwin, and get that quote, and get that quote inside you, okay? Um, because you need to face it head on. There will be times where there'll be calls for diversity. I, I got it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get up off this in a second. There are gonna be times where you make calls for diversity and it won't be valued. And it won't be valued in the spaces which you will inhabit because you won't stand. And you need to stand. And you need to understand that you are there for a purpose. You were made for a purpose. And where you are, you're to live on purpose. So sometimes you have to demand that you be respected. You can't shy away from getting what you're owed. And what you're owed is dignity and respect. That's for everybody. No matter who you are, that's for you. And you have to realize that you are good enough to be exactly where you are. And you have to tell yourself that. And you have to start out in the mirror every day telling yourself that. And then you need to go to the window and find somebody that doesn't believe it and go tell them about it. Do you hear me? I'm Thank you, sir. I got the blue paper. <laughs> I'm finished. <laughs> Round's complete. Ms. Ortiz, uh, just to restate the question is. Just answer the question. <laughs> what were some of your greatest failures and how did you use these failures to fuel your success? You know, as I get older, I'm, I'm, I'm realizing that what at that point I consider was a failure, it was a great learning experience. I hated it at the moment, I'm not gonna lie to you. I remember clearly one of those, I was earlier in my career, and I saw this job that I really wanted. And I was like, I can do this, I'm qualified, I have everything they need, and there's a lot I can bring to the table. I did the interview, I prepared, I researched a lot, I had all my facts and all the things that you can learn. I knew I got that job. Well, I didn't get it, <laughs> and it felt horrible. But one thing I learned from that moment is I went back to them, to the committee, and I asked, I said, I need to know, I would really appreciate if you can give me feedback regarding this session, what happened. I thought I was very well prepared, I researched you, I even know each one of you, and I know your background, <laughs> you know? Um, they gave me great feedback, and that lesson that I learned at that moment that I thought it was a failure has helped me throughout the years in my career. And personally, you know, um, don't get too comfortable, you know, be humble at the same time, but then also believe in yourself. And it was a blessing at that moment that I didn't get your job, to be very honest. <laughs> you know, now that I think about it as time, but many times we think that what I, I thought that what it was failure at the moment, it were, they were great lessons for me that I needed. Thank you. Ms. Daniels? You always give me the hard ones. Um, I'm glad that you asked me this one, actually, because I have been thinking about this. And, uh, you know, for me, I think my greatest failure up until 2021 uh, was really that I hadn't challenged myself enough to do anything to fail. And so, I really didn't have an opportunity to fail at anything. And I got to a point where I've reached this point in my life and I'm like, what story do I have to tell? What have I learned? I, I haven't done anything. What have I held myself back from um, in terms of life? How could I have changed the world if I would have done something that uh, would have challenged me enough to fail, 
right? You know, everybody has like smaller learning lessons that they learn and there's always situational things, but I knew for me that I could have done something greater and that was a failure for me is not trying uh, bigger things. Thank you. Our next question is, was there a point where your values were challenged? What did that feel like and how did you respond? Mentha? Sure. So I was also reflecting back on the question about have you, were you discriminated against? And when I was an undergrad, I didn't necessarily have the language for it. So folks were doing things that probably were not overt, but there were some convert, covert things that were happening, so not as readily available, uh, apparent. Um, I think in terms of my values being challenged, being an undergraduate at a predominantly white institution and not believing that that institution wanted to create space for students of color to be successful. And so I was the founding president of that black student union and really advocating and pushing hard that there needed to be more programs beyond the EOP program. And one of the questions that came up was, why do you think we should have something different or separate for black students at the time? And then challenging my thoughts around equity and inclusion, again, at the time didn't really have the words, but knew that something was a mess. And so what I did is I went back and connected with my father, um, an older gentleman who'd been born in the Deep South, and we really talked about the importance of stay focused on your goals and objectives, and you do indeed have a responsibility to try to make the world better than what you found it. And so by you continuing to advocate and agitate against the administration, you may not reap the benefits of it, but others coming behind you might. So that's one situation that comes to mind for me. Thank you. For these next few questions, I'm going to open up for the entire panel to answer. Um, the first one is, how do, you, how do you deal with imposter syndrome? And did your education provide you with the tools to, uh, to fight that in your field? Uh, I will start with uh, Mr. Lewis Brunson. Can you go a little deeper on what you mean by imposter syndrome? Is that uh... imposter syndrome is it's when you feel like you don't have the tools necessary to be in that space. You're you don't have the knowledge. You're lacking something in that space. And how do you overcome that? And did education was education that thing that opened up your toolbox to fitting in that space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll give an example of when I've been in, in one of my careers, one of the, the jobs I've had. I've been in rooms where conversations were being had and I had no idea what folks were talking about. And, um, you know, they, there was a question posed to me, you know, Lewis, what do you think we ought to do about this? And um, I had the option to say or make something up or just say, you know, I don't know. Um, we should talk about it. Let's figure out how we can solve this. Uh, versus trying to pretend that I knew the answer or feeling like I'm embarrassed if, if I sound dumb. But I, I'm a big proponent of, of just, if you don't have the answer, just don't answer it. Just say, hey, you know, I don't know, but let's try to figure it out, so. Thank you. Loki? Well, you know, um, and I'm, I'm gonna say this, but not as a brag. Um, you know, so I've won a lot of awards for the films that I do. Um, and I, I get a lot of recognition for that. And every time I do a film, I feel like an imposter. Like, who am I to do this film? You know, you're no good. Uh, and it, it's, it's I, I always, for whatever reason, I start at that base um, that someone's gonna figure this out, <laughs> that I don't belong, uh, that I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, and I just, for myself, just, uh, I just push through, you know, I, I have to, I, it's, it's a lot of self-talk um, that, you know, that I, I do belong and I, I know what I'm doing. Um, and, you know, I, I, I did a film called After Selma about uh, voter suppression and since the Summit of Montgomery March. And Carol Anderson is this New York Times bestselling author and everything else. I'm like, there's no way she's ever going to talk to me. And I kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. Because uh, I didn't think. And then I just, I, 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 I sent her this email and I loaded it up. I mean, I got this award. And of course, I talked about my mom. I, you know, I've, you know, I've dropped my mom card. <laughs> and uh, she's like, I'd love to do this. You know, and I, later on, I asked her, you know, what, what was it? You know, and I was trying to see what the magic was. She goes, I just like the idea. You know, you know what you're doing. And it was like, wow, okay. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, we, our, our, our greatest, typically our greatest enemy is ourselves. And we just need to come overcome ourselves and, and know that we, we can do it. Thank you. Mr. Braithwaite. Well, whether it was in school or while I was working on a job, I know I don't know everything <laughs> because I've been working in engineering and in information technology and in management, and there's always something new coming about. As was said before, when you don't know, just say you don't know or ask to explain what do you mean. Maybe you understand it using a different terminology, whatever the subject might be. So admit you don't know, but try to learn as much as you can. I, I used the phrase earlier, continuous learning. Because I was in an industry or in industry or academia where there's always something being learned and there's so many different subjects around us. I was always in school. I didn't finish my doctorate until I, after I retired. <laughs> so I continue to learn and you can see behind me, I still have books that I pull off the shelf because I did, I used them when I was in college and undergraduate in math and electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. And I didn't master it. So now I'm looking at it and it comes easier. So uh, admitting you don't know, asking for help, explaining it for our further explanation is the way I approach it. But I've never run into anything that I didn't know something about. And with a little assistance, I was able to make a contribution. Thank you. Ms. Daniels. Again, I knew you were coming to me. Um, <laughs> I, I actually just had this moment uh, yesterday and um, uh, I, don't, I just uh, was elected to uh, Tacoma City Council and um, my first task uh, before being sworn in was that I was uh, on the committee for hiring our new uh, police chief. And so um, I just had this moment of this is my first time in this space uh, doing something that I just never thought I would do. And I just had a moment of like, I think I should just leave. Like, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. Like, why would they choose me to do this? This is, this is a huge job. And I had to like, just gather my thoughts like, baby girl, 20,000 people said you should be here. You are okay. You've prepared for this. You can do this work and you have the tools. You went to school. This is why you, you did all of these things so that you could do this. And, um, you know, God, my spirits, my ancestors, they really like spoke into me. And, and then, you know, at the end of it, I realized why I was there. Uh, but I definitely had that moment. Thank you. Mr. Brunson. Yeah, yeah, for me, it, uh, it, it starts with recognizing the difference, whether it's coming from me or coming external to me, uh, recognizing the difference between a critique and an assessment. A critique has no solution to it. An assessment comes with steps that I can take that are going to make me better and keep me where I am. Okay? You don't go to school to be a three-star general. You don't go to school to be a two-star general. You don't go to school to be a one-star general. It's based on performance and potential. I've got to live up to that every day, that potential. So I would tell you that sometimes when I look in the mirror, I go, dude, they're going to find out. You just moved into this brand new big house. You know, you, you, she's talking about picking a chief. I'm talking about living in the house I'm living in. It was like 8,000 square feet. I can't move out of there. I got stuff, right? But I make an assessment of myself. Hey, X, you need to read this book. Everybody's talking about this book. Go read it so you can be in the conversation. And that's because you want to be in the space. We're talking about space. You want to be in the space, earn your place to the space. Sounds like Jesse Jackson, didn't it? Right. 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 But anyway, your place so, in that space. <laughs> but that's what you have to do. You have to be willing to do that. If it's somewhere you want to be, the only way you're going to dominate it is by making an assessment, getting your place, and staying there. And it'll be internal or it'll be external. The worst, though, is when we criticize ourselves. Thank you. Ms. Ortiz? Thank you so much. That was extremely helpful. Um, I had that moment coming through those doors. <laughs> when I started looking at everybody who's here, I said, I don't know if I should even be here. I don't know if they, what, what are they going to get out of this, you know? But um, yes, there's many times where you have feelings of self-doubt and, and, um, and you doubt your even personal competence, but I will say one thing, uh, examples for me is uh, when I go to conferences, especially in higher ed, you know, even when I'm doing presentations, there's, I come through the doors and I see all those peers of mine with all their 
terminal degrees. And here I am looking at myself wondering, what in the world am I doing here? What are they gonna learn from here, from me at this point? But um, even when I'm getting ready to start the presentation, but one thing, I, I, I'm, I have my personal cheerleaders, you know? Mm -hmm. And I go back to my family and they're like, you got this girl. Mija, look at your resume. Go back to that resume and look that you deserve to be there. And there's a lot that they're gonna learn from you, you know? And, and, and that reminds me that, I, yes, I belong here and that I'm contributing to this knowledge and the information that, that they're looking for. So yeah, I go back to my cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Hines. I just want to jump in and say that, you know, I'm accustomed to being the only woman at the table. In higher ed, that happens pretty frequently. I've been in spaces where I've been the only black person at the table, so that happens pretty frequently. You know, I've been, I'm accustomed to also being the young, well, not so much anymore, but early I would be the youngest person <laughs> at the table, right? And so I've learned, though, that I've earned to be at the table. I'm supposed to be there. And so whenever, I told you as an undergraduate, I had that conversation, can I do this, can I do this? Now I know, heck yeah, I can do it. I've been very successful. That would be what I would offer to everyone here and to all University of Washington students. You earned your right to be here. This is your place. Claim it, be comfortable, disrupt it, but don't ever question whether or not you have the right to be here or whether or not you've earned a seat at the table, because indeed you have, and we learn from your voice and we learn from your experiences. So the imposter syndrome, I've kind of learned how to check that to the side. I know when I show up, I'm here, I'm a vice chancellor, I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Our next question, did your education experience prepare you to navigate your workspace? Uh, we'll start this off with Loki. Oh, well, no, <laughs> that's a short answer. You know, uh, I mean, I went to school to study film and uh, studying film is not the same as making films. And so life is, uh, is the greatest teacher in that respect. So there are things that you do learn in regards to theory and whatever else and learning how to interact with people. But at the end of the day, um, it's, it's a lot of trial and error. And it's also just a, a lot of having faith in yourself and, and in your vision. Ms. Daniels. Yeah, my mom is talking super loud with her headphones on today. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know, I learned in the middle of uh, college that like college is not really to teach you how to do your job. Uh, it's not really to teach you so you know everything. College is there to teach you so that you could figure out how to learn what you need to learn when you get on the job, right? I learned the tools of how to figure anything out anywhere I go. And that was one of the most important things that I think I learned was my ability to think critically. And if I didn't get anything else, you know, there's bits and pieces of what you get about like decorum and working with others and just kind of like professional pieces, but really, I learned how to question my own thoughts, how to question materials, how to um, look at things. And, there, and then learning really never stops. You're really never prepared enough. There's always work to do. So um, the work really kind of starts as soon as you graduate. Mr. Braithwaite. College provided me with skills in various disciplines, but no, it did not prepare me for a career. How and what would I do or should I have done? I did not do it. Well, some of it I did. But what I would recommend is internships help prepare people for a career. Coming out of college, you may have the skills of an engineer or maybe how to solve engineering problems, but you're not necessarily an engineer yet because you haven't been given the opportunity to get, here's a problem, come up with a solution. You may come up with a solution which is theoretical, but then now how do you do the analysis to make sure that that solution is applicable? So internships help, knowing and talking with people who are already in the space that you're thinking about pursuing also helps to guide you, can give you some guidance about what's going to be, what you should expect when you get there. The, the other th thing that I noted when I saw that question was some things that we want to understand. In school, they don't tell us about these things, but the organization structure, the disciplines, 
that go together in a company, for example, that actually surround you. You come in and you're in engineering or you're in manufacturing or you're in finance or what have you. Who are the other members of the team and how do we work together? Try to learn something about organization structure and then build relationships once you're inside the door with disciplines, people from other disciplines, people you can network with. It'll help you be prepared for what you're going to look, what you're getting into. Thank you. Mr. Brunson? Yeah, for me, um, it's really, um, I think, relationships that uh, sort of help me in my personal career, my professional career, the relationships experiences I've had in college um, and in life. Um, in college, dealing with a lot of folks that are insecure, um, dealing with people that, um, you know, bad roommates, don't pay bills, do things that you, that compromise your values. And so you see those things as you're in college. Then when you get into your professional career and you move forward in life, you see some similarities. And so those experiences that I learned from uh, when I was in college made me realize, hey, you know what, everybody's different, but there are some times where you still have to deal with other people and how they carry themselves. Um, so that prepared me to deal with situations at work. You know, at work there are folks that are still acting like they're at a cheerleading competition or uh, insecure. They handle money wrong. Um, those are the things you see in life. It's just another step, another graduated step from your college experience to teach you how to move through life as an individual. So in some regards, that did prepare me uh, for the navigations that I have to deal with today. Thank you. This has been an amazing talk. We only have two more questions, but the next question I feel is the most important question. We often have a lot of conversations about making inclusive spaces or how do we belong in a space. What actions would you all, as the panelists, advise UW, the students, faculty, staff, to do to make this a reality here? I'll start with Ms. Mentha. <laughs> you don't even give me time to process it. Okay, uh, some actionable items. And so, first of all, to indeed uh, understand that you do and have earned space in this community. Um, find your voice and exercise your voice and do so in a way that allows others to exercise their voice too. I sometimes worry that in today's dynamic, we're in this space where we're really polarized. Either you're with me or you're against me. Um, and I would like to say, let's talk about the ways in which we can have a healthy dialogue and dissent, but also in addition to the critique, offer an assessment. So you've identified some problems that help us to figure out what the resolution might be like. Um, get to know each other. When we walk across the campus, I'm always taken aback by how students just put their heads down and keep going. And I know the mask doesn't make it easy, but we can smile, we can smile with our eyes or you can acknowledge someone. I think that too helps to create the space where it's not so chilly and so isolating, but it feels more welcome and friendly. So that's our couple things that I would bring forward. Ms. Ortiz. You know, to create inclusive spaces, I believe that you need to include in the process the people that are gonna be on that space. I think it's extremely important. They need to be part of it. I include myself, we need to be part of the process of the, the thought process of creating the space, the planning and the work and getting the work done. Um, it's easy just to, I think it's easy for me to say, well, we need this on this space and then not work for it. <laughs> you know, and just sitting back and wait until it happens. No. We need to include those who are going to be in, the, in this, that particular space, they need to be part of the entire process. The thinking, the planning, and the work. Thank you. Mr. Brunson? Yeah, I, I would say what you're really talking about is stewardship. Right. You have to steward the space that you create, mm -hmm. which means it has to be nurtured, and you've got to be respectful of that space and everybody that's in it. Uh, I think that uh, a sense of community is the strongest thing. You know, there's a, a certain affinity that we all have. We, you know, it started out with us talking about belonging. And that's that sense of community that we all desire. Um, so as you build that, recognize that you've got to do the work. You've got to put it in. Uh, you've got to make your assessments, as Minta said. And then you've got to steward that space. So many times we, we fight to create a space and then we don't want to do the work. So we want to be owners of a space, but we don't want to steward it because that's the hard part. Just having even this engagement we're having right now is easy because you've got Minta who told you to be here. 
and, <laughs> and you all knew you better show up. Uh, but stewarding it from this, so if you take nothing more from people's time uh, that they gave you today, there, that's a start. And then you just shepherd that along and you steward it and you keep checking in on it to make sure it meets your original intent. Mr. Brinson? Yeah, thank you. One of the things that uh, has bothered me um, from college all the way through my, in, in my current career is what uh, we call affinity groups. And then also the word having an ally. A lot of folks disagree with me. Um, we've, every culture has fought so hard and so long to have a place at the table, but we continue to put each other in different spaces, mm -hmm. right? We're in different spaces, but we're still, you know, clawing to be at the table. Um, one thing I think would be great here at the University of, of Washington would be to go at each of these different affinity groups or organizations or communities, bring them together and put them in the room with folks that can make decisions and have them air out their, their concerns. Because a lot of times you find yourself in a uh, uh, Latino, Latina organization, an African American organization, and you guys are sitting in a room and you're talking amongst yourself about the problems. Those aren't the people that need to hear the problems. So in order to get to a different place, in order to get a seat at the table, you need the right people in the room for, you to, for them to hear you, and you need to be able to voice those grievances accordingly. So that's what I would recommend. Mr. Mohan? You, you know, I, I, I love college students because uh, they're the ones who make the change. I mean, when we go back to the civil rights movement, the real foot soldiers were the students. They were the ones that were out there. Um, as my mom has said, you know, I can't do everything, but I can do something because doing nothing's not an option. And when you think about those four guys sitting at the lunch counter in Greensboro, within months, it was tens of thousands of people. And so you can truly make a change. And uh, people ask my mom all the time, well, how do you do it? How do you do it? And her response is always the exact same, you know, and everyone seems to try to overcomplicate it. And she says, you know, you, know, you find a problem, get some friends together and go solve it. They're like, yeah, but what about social media and this, that, and this? She goes, let me repeat that one more time. <laughs> <laughs> Find a problem, get some friends together and go solve it. Just, just make good trouble. Ms. Daniels? Yeah, I was thinking a lot about this one and um, I'm not sure what the, the subject is in, in college or what, what problem, what exact problem you're trying to solve in terms of belonging, but um, I think a lot about um, built space. Um, I think a lot about color. I think a lot about marketing. Um, that's really what, what a lot of my work is, is to make culturally responsive and inclusive spaces. And that really includes saying things without saying that you are safe here, saying things without saying that you belong here. If that means I have to light incense to let, you know, certain people know like this is that kind of space. If I have to play music in the beginning of a Zoom to let you know like, to make you comfortable at the beginning, right? Like what kind of food am I offering? Um, all other things that I think about equity, like those, the first pieces of like, are you paid to be here? What is your experience like? What are you giving up to be in this space? How can I help accommodate you to let you know that you belong in this space? Childcare, you know, those kind of things that um, sometimes we forget about when we're saying that we want people to come to a space, but we don't think about the barriers of them getting there. Um, those are just the, the smaller things that I'm thinking about, but this can go so deep. This can go surface level and it can go very deep. Mr. Brigley. I agree with everything that uh, has been said. During my years at the university, I was a pre-doctoral and an extension lecturer for about 10 years and I didn't do it. But when I went to MIT as a Sloan fellow, one of the things, there were 56 of us and one of the things the school did was to divide the class up into carpools, people who lived close to each other. So we would commute together to campus. In the classes, we were assigned, we were given assignments based on class carpools from time to time. This would force us to get together away from campus in our evenings and weekends to work the problem, to work the assignment that was given. It's expected that everybody in the carpool made a contribution to the solution of the problem and also in presenting the problem back in the classroom. And it was graded as a carpool or a team problem. I'm going back very basic. 
I don't see any reason why the same concept couldn't be applied in undergraduate school. There are subject matters where you could pull together the class, divide it up into teams, and give the assignment with the expectation that everybody will make a contribution. There won't be any loafers. True, we were all managers in the fellowship program, so we knew how to work together and what teams were. In undergraduate school, maybe you will have to provide some preparation, some orientation for the student. What does it mean to be a team player? Thank you. And what does it mean to work as a part of a team? And that knowledge gained from that orientation will help that student throughout their life because it goes into industry. In many industries today, things are done by teams from different disciplines. And it also overcomes the issue of the discrimination between because you're there with a certain qualification or a certain skill. You're making your own contribution based on your knowledge. Thank you, Mr. So Gray. That's that was, a recommendation I would suggest. That was a great point. Um, with our last couple of minutes, I would just like to give each of you 30 seconds to give advice to your younger self about occupying the space that you're currently in. Um, so we'll start at the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll go reverse order. <laughs> Mr. Brenton, starting with you. Uh, the first thing I would say is go buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> Drop out and get you a ticket. No, I'm kidding. Um, build relationships. I think that is so key. Uh, what's helped me um, when I was young, my father and mother always made us build relationships and meet people. So I think that's going to be the one of the big strong pillars of keys for you guys. Thank you. Mr. Brenton? It's okay to be a cheerleader for other folks. Ms. Ortiz? Mija, cógelo con calma. Do not rush. You know, <laughs> take advantage and learn a, a, as much as possible. Yeah, from the experiences even outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And network. Make sure you network. Ms. Hines? You can make a mistake and recover. If you were to look at my transcript, I have a big fat F. I worked hard for that F. <laughs> and guess what? I graduated, I have a job, and I have this big fancy title. So mistakes, can you can learn from your mistakes. Loki. Um, serve, just serve others. Mr. Braithwaite. I suggest you diversify your areas of study. Think about what's coming, what's on the horizon in terms of preparing yourself for a career. So you're not just locked into something that might be of no use in a few years. I also suggest that you try to live a balanced life, work hard, take your responsibilities seriously and build a good network, a supportive one. Ms. Daniels. Um, you know, in all of my, my 32 years of being um, being a person, nobody's ever asked me about my grades in college. Nobody ever asked me how academic I was. What they asked me is for recommendations from the people and the teachers that were around me or the professors, excuse me. Um, and so what is important in the real world are your relationships like that has already been said. How did you show up? How did you show your voice? How did you think? And what kind of person were you while you were there? Those are the things that people remember and the relationships that you build now will be the ones that you rely on when you are looking to advance your career or figure out where you're gonna be later. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for coming. This was an amazing talk, but that's what it was. It was just a talk. <laughs> the next step, for us, not only here at UWT, but UW, Seattle, Bothell, all college campuses, is to put the work in. It's time for us to get to work. And with these inspirational words by our leaders and our communities, and some that even represent us around the nation, um, we know that we can do it. So thank you, and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.